Welcome to Cushman Wakefield's Asia Pacific Capital Markets webinar featuring our very latest data for Q1 2021. 2020 was an extraordinarily difficult year for many, so I'm extremely pleased that the Q1 figures we're going to summarize today demonstrate that many countries across Asia Pacific are now generally in recovery and expansion mode and commercial real estate markets across the dynamic Asian cities that we track appear to be staging a strong and very welcome comeback. Hopefully you will have had a flavor of the, for this if you've received our city by city Q1 market beat research publications on key commercial property markets across Asia Pacific, which were released very quickly at the end of the quarter. Please drop Catherine Chen or I an email if you wish to subscribe for these, our, white, our twice weekly Asia Pacific Capital Markets newsfeed or any other Cushman and Wakefield publications. As usual, we will start off this quarterly webinar with an overview of the latest on the Asia Pacific market and then move to this quarter's spotlight session on Australia, a key market which we note has been generating an increasing amount of international investor interest recently. We've lined up some excellent speakers today. We will kick off first hearing from Catherine Chen, our subject matter expert for capital markets research in Asia Pacific. Catherine will cover the key markets in Asia Pacific and provide an update on the latest Q1 figures driving real estate investment markets. John Sears, our head of research in Australia and New Zealand, will then follow through with today's spotlight with an overview of the latest data and trends on the Australia market. Following this, we'll move to the panel discussion and Q&A, and I'm delighted that today we have some of the most experienced industry professionals on capital markets in Asia Pacific, Josh Cullen, Dennis Yeo, and Gordon Marsden. Based out of Sydney, Josh is head of capital markets at Cushman and Wakefield Australia and New Zealand. His team specializes in high profile transactions across Australia. Josh has worked on some of the country's largest portfolio sales campaigns and asset transactions. Based out of Singapore, Dennis heads up the Asia Pacific investor services business, working closely with Cushman and Wakefield capital markets business globally. Dennis is responsible for maintaining a close relationship with our clients across the region helping them secure attractive investments to enhance their real estate portfolios. And based out of Hong Kong, Gordon is Regional Director of Asia Pacific Capital Markets and is responsible for client engagement and investor relations in the region. Gordon provides strategic advice and assistance with capital solutions and coordinates Cushman and Wakefield's brokerage services to clientele across the region. So with that, I'm delighted to hand you over to Catherine for the latest Asia Pacific update. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, before diving into the commercial real estate investment market, I'd like to start with an overview of the regional economic update. According to Moody's latest analysis on, on global business cycle, Asia Pacific was the strongest performing region in Q1, with most economies were either in recovery or expansion mode. Mainland China, Vietnam, and Taiwan were the, were the strong, strongest growing regions with positive GDP growth recorded in 2020 and are poised for further economic expansion this year. The rest of the major economies, Australia, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and India are all on road to recovery. Nonetheless, there are still some risk factors that need to be closely monitored during the remainder of the year, including the recent emerge of super virus in India and a comeback of new cases in Singapore and Taiwan, as well as an, as well as an escalation of trade tension between China and Australia. Going forward, we expect each country's economic growth to be largely dependent on internal growth in the near term, as well as the government ability to control the pandemic and the extent of physical stimulus is provided. Our next slide, looking at the long-term picture, Moody's forecast GDP growth over the next decade will be led by countries such as Philippines, India, and Vietnam. Worth noting, mainland China, even after a decade of high growth of nearly 8% annually, is still poised for an average growth of 5% over the next decade. Given that China is already the second largest economy in the world, such scale and rate of growth brings enormous investment opportunities in the country's real estate market. We have a separate uh, webinar series focusing on the greater China market, and please feel free to email me if you're interested in listening to our um, past event replace or to be added to our future invitation list. Back to the GDP forecast. Um, interestingly, Australia is expected to see the highest GDP growth among the mature economies 
over the next 10 years and an average growth rate of 2.9%. Th- this is significantly higher when comparing with a 1.7% in South Korea and a 1.2% in Japan. Australia's economy will be largely driven by an expected return of student immigration by the second half of 2020, as student immigration accounted for nearly one quarter of the population gains in 2019. This will in turn boost growth in Australia's education, employment and real estate sector. Next slide, let's take a look at the commercial real estate investment uh, environment in Asia Pacific in Q1. Total transaction volume was down by about 10% year on year to around 35 billion US dollar in Q1, starting the year uh, relatively slowly. A few core markets such as Japan and South Korea saw transaction volumes down this quarter, but we expect deal activity to bounce back again in the remainder of the year, especially for office and logistics assets. Um, given the current deal pipeline, and we uh, expect yields to further compress for core assets in Japan and South Korea in the near term. uh, Despite the investment volume drop, Tokyo and Seoul still remain as top transacting markets in Asia Pacific last quarter, followed by Hong Kong, Sydney, and Shenzhen, which all saw transaction volume edging up compared to 12 months ago. Deal activity in Hong Kong was largely driven by transactions of industrial properties, which accounted for over half of the total investment volume in Q1. In Shenzhen, end user buyers were very active, um, uh, <clears throat> acquiring office assets for self-use, and Sydney was also driven by a very active office market, with several buildings being changed hand in the quarter, such as Martin Place, Ferro uh, Insurance Headquarter, and the Macquarie Corporate Center. In Q1, we continue to see active investors outside APAC, um, especially uh, especially Canadian investors who became increasingly aggressive in their Asia-Pacific strategy over, over the past 12 months. Most recently in Q1, Canada-based Bento Green Oak uh, just acquired two off- office blocks in Japan in addition to an intended buyout of metropolitan real estate from Carlisle. Last month, Canada Fabio also injected an um, additional 400 million US dollar into Heinz's uh, latest fund, Asia Property Partners, targeting deals in markets such as Japan, Australia, and South Korea. Furthermore, Ivanhoe Cambridge also partnered with India based Embassy Group, targeting Bins Park projects in India. Um, a, um, another Canadian investor entering India following Brookview's two billion acquisition of an office p- portfolio in India last year. In addition, Singaporean investors in comparison with 12 months ago also became more active in Q1 this year. Significant cross-border deals by Singaporean investors included Maple Tree's acquisition of several logistics centers in South Korea and joint venture purchase of office buildings in India by GIC and Ascendas. Singapore also has been an increasingly popular investment destination for overseas capital in Q1, joining Japan, Australia, China, and India as the top five targets of cross-border capital. If you are interested in hearing more about capital flows and investment um, activity in Japan, China, and India, you you can find our past webinar replays on our APA Real Estate Investment Hub website, and we will be doing our next webinar um, focusing on Singapore and Southeast Asia. So please stay tuned. Uh, the next page provides a visual look at the capital flows from North America and Europe into Asia Pacific and where the most uh, popular investment destinations are. As you can see on the map over here, uh, Australia has been particularly popular with uh, European investors and the large deals in Q1 included MNG's purchase of 400 George Street in Sydney for 1 billion Australian dollar and DECA's purchase of uh, Riverside Plaza in Melbourne for almost half billion Australian dollar. Uh, in addition to se- several large portfolio deals of, distribu- of distribution centers and student housing. The longer lease terms and relatively higher yields in Australia compared to other mature markets in Asia have made Australia attractive to international buyers, um, especially from Europe. For North American capital, the more popular 
uh, locations of late were Japan, Singapore, and India. In, in addition to the Canadian capital we talked, uh, we just talked earlier, most recently US-based investment manager PGIM has also acquired an office tower in both Tokyo and Singapore, and they are looking to deploy more capital in Asia Pacific in the next few years. This slide provides a by sector and a by market um, overview of Q1's transaction volume in comparison with the same quarter last year. For time reasons, I wouldn't go into too much detail, but would like to highlight a few key ob observations. And the first is an increasing allocation of capital to industrial assets, especially logistics assets, as, a, as the proportion of industrial investment has increased from 19% last year to 25% this year. The second is that we start to see a rebound in retail investment uh, led by a recovering retail market in China and Australia as COVID has been re relatively under control in these two countries. In China, we saw retail sales growth in Q1 hit 34% and we expect to see more retail deals in China being closed later this year. Lastly, um, as shown by the bar charts over here, investment in Australia was up in Q1 in almost all property sectors when comparing to the same quarter last year. And John will speak more about the by sector trends in Australia later. My final slide, uh, taking a reference from NREF, NREF's latest capital raising survey, the key message here is uh, to show strong strong investor preference uh, towards mature markets such as Aust Australia and Japan, as well as assets that can provide stable cash flows and are relatively pandemic proof. The top left hand chart shows that the large majority, 76%, um, Maggie, uh, can you please bring to the last page, next page? Yeah, so the top left hand chart shows uh, that the large majority, 76% of the investment managers surveys wor worldwide indicated an intention to increase capital raising activity over the next two years, the highest ratio seen on record, indicating investors' strong confidence in the real estate market and an intention to capture COVID-related opportunities. Asia Pacific wide, Australia and Japan are the most favored markets by non-listed real estate funds in 2020. Most recently in 2021, US-based Great Star has also secured its largest capital raising to date, investing in Australia's beauty rent market. And at the same time, CBREGI also injected additional funding into their Japan logistic vehicle, topping up its APAT value add fund. On multi-country strategy, Black Rod recently closed its um, Asia Property Fund 5, valued at 1.2 billion US dollar, targeting repositioning and redevelopment opportunities in Japan, Australia, Singapore, mainland China, and Hong Kong. And these have all demonstrated the, the aggressiveness that global investors are now taking on their Asia Pacific investment strategy. By investment style, most uh, most investors prefer core or value add investments and on a by sector basis there's increasing allocation to um, to industrial fundraising last year and this is reflected in the recent transactions such as uh, ESR and GIC's recent acquisition of the milestone logistic portfolio in Australia for a record 2.9 billion US dollar last month. This deal has also set a new bar for red house investment in Australia, further squeezing the, the yields in the industrial sector. And with that, I will now hand over to John to speak more about the Australian commercial real estate market. Over to you, John. Thank you, Catherine. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Well, um, Australia has sometimes been called the lucky country and indeed by a mixture of good fortune and good management, we've been lucky enough to have nearly 30, 30 years of continuous stable economic growth. That of course changed last year with the COVID pandemic and in Q2 we had a very short and sharp decrease in economic growth. Economic growth fell by nearly 8% in Q2, mainly due to the shutdown of the economy um, with COVID social distancing. 
by Q3 and Q4, economic growth was recovering quite strongly. Economic growth was up by about 4% in Q3 and Q4. And in Q1 this year, we expect continued strong economic growth. The strong growth was a mixture of three main things. One, there was massive stimulus from the government um, in terms of uh, supporting both employment and uh, investment. There was also ultra low interest rates. So interest rates fell to just 0.1%. Uh, that's the government's official uh, overnight cash rate. And also there was our relative success in containing the pandemic. Apart from some um, relatively brief outbreaks, Australia hasn't had virtually uh, any uh, local transmission of COVID and that's allowed people to get out and start spending. We couldn't travel overseas and it's been estimated that the increase of Australian spending at home and not overseas has more than outweighed the lack of tourism and adding about 1% to GDP uh, in net flows from uh, tourism spending. Um, so that's quite a boost at the moment. Looking forward for the next few years, economic growth is expected to remain above trend, supporting uh, our, our overall economic growth. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Those stronger economic conditions and relative optimism are showing up in both consumer sentiment and business sentiment. This particular slide shows uh, on the darker line the measure of consumer sentiment. The most recent data shows that consumer sentiment is now at an 11 year high. It's strongest level since um, 2010, just after the GFC. Business conditions are also at record high, as is business uh, confidence. So data released last week showed that business confidence is at a new record high and in March business conditions were at a record high and they went even higher in April. So um, it's very strong business conditions at the moment. Perhaps if we could go to the next slide please. Um, the outlook is also quite strong. This is, uh, these forecasts come from uh, Moody's Analytics, our global uh, economic uh, data supplier. And what it shows is annual average economic growth that's forecast for the next 10, 20 and 30 years. And amongst the major developed economies, Australia has the strongest growth forecasts for those, out, uh, those periods. In fact, it's not too far off uh, India and China forecasts. So we've recovered quite strongly and providing uh, we can contain the pandemic, um, we, should, we have quite a strong outlook ahead as well. Next slide, please. That's been reflected in a bounce back in investment volumes. Uh, in the lead up to the pandemic, Australia was increasing, uh, was it was um, experiencing stronger and stronger investment flows. We had a record of nearly of $45.5 billion worth of uh, investment volume in 2019. That of course dropped off in uh, 2020 with the pandemic. That decline was mainly in the first, second and third quarters growth in transaction volume bounced back quite strongly in the final quarter of the year and also remained relatively strong in the first quarter of this year. Um, Josh, would you like to make any comments on that uh, rebound in investment activity? Yeah, thanks, John. I think um, uh, to everything you've been saying about where Australia sits in terms of COVID and the quick recovery, then that's been a big bonus for foreign investment into Australia. So. We certainly have seen that fourth quarter 2020 uh, rebound quickly and that has carried on early into 2021 uh, across most sectors. Uh, industrial has been one of the, the biggest biggest benefactors of that recovery with some of the largest transactions that have taken place, the Blackstone Milestone uh, portfolio. And we've started to see some larger commercial transactions take place as well which is also filtering down to, you know, B and A grade transactions uh, right across all our markets from uh, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Brisbane and Perth, which is again showing signs of good confidence and uh, quicker recovery than first thought. Thanks, Josh. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, the, this particular chart shows on the left hand side the share by sector of transaction volume in Q1 and on the right hand um, chart uh, 
the share over the 12 months to Q1. Uh, you can see that particularly in Q1, it was mainly the office sector, which uh, where most of the activity was, and also uh, in uh, over 2020. But as Josh mentioned, industrial did pick up significantly in 2020. There wasn't so many transactions in Q1, but since Q1 closed, there's been a couple of very big transactions, including the milestone uh, uh, transaction, as well as uh, Moorbank Logistics Park, which traded for $1.6 billion. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, what we uh, can see here is the transaction volume by quarter. The darker blue line is where the capital is sourced from Australia. The lighter blue bars are where it's offshore um, source capital. And you can see that during the first part of the pandemic, as Australia's borders were shut and it was harder and there was a lot more uncertainty, investment volume fell away, particularly for uh, offshore purchases, but that did bounce back quite strongly in Q4 and remains relatively strong in Q1. So despite our closed borders, we've still got a lot of interest from overseas uh, investors. And in terms of just the amount of offshore investment, it's averaging, uh, it averaged about 40% in the few years prior to uh, the pandemic and it's getting back up towards that level again now. Could we go to the next slide, please, Maggie? Um, one of the there's a couple of reasons why we're seeing that uh, strong attraction one is the relatively strong economic growth i mentioned but also um, investment returns are quite high compared to fixed interest products so this particular chart shows income returns from the three main sectors as reported by msci against the 10-year government bond rate and while the 10-year government bond has increased a little over the past few months that spread between income return and uh, bond yields is, is at record highs. If we go to the next slide, please. Australia's yields are also relatively strong compared to many other uh, markets around the world. On this one, we can see prime office cap rates for uh, major uh, office markets around the world. The red line represents the average prime yield for the Sydney uh, market. And while Sydney yields are near record lows, they're um, higher than uh, many other major markets around the world, which combined with the strong economy and ultra low interest rates is helping to drive investment attraction. Next slide, please. Um, while office yields are low and they haven't moved higher, uh, some of the fundamentals did deteriorate last year for the office markets. And what this particular slide shows is the range of vacancy rates as reported by the Property Council of Australia over the past 30 odd years. The little red lines are the highest vacancy rates got to since 1990, the green dots are the lows. The darker blue squares is the average and the blue diamonds were what Property Council reported vacancy was at the start of this year. Now at the beginning, pre-pandemic, the vacancy rate for Sydney and Melbourne was down near that record low levels. However, because of the shutdown and uncertainty, uh, increased sublease, more work from home, vacancy rates have risen. And for Sydney and Melbourne, they're up around that sort of long-term average rate at the moment. Uh, that did mainly occur in Q2 and Q3 last year, and we saw a deterioration in rents. Perhaps if we could go to the next slide, please. This just sort of shows a summary of the major stats for the four main markets over the past um, 12 months. So vacancy did rise in all markets and uh, incentives in Sydney went from about 21% to averaging about 33% on a gross basis in Sydney and the gross effective rent declined from about 1,075 to uh, just over $900 per square metre per annum. We had similar declines in rents uh, across most other markets, and that was face rents did hold up, but incentives or, uh, all did increase quite substantially, and that was what contributed to the decline in, um, in rents in office markets. However, in Q1, thanks largely to that st stronger business conditions, 
the uh, the rents have started to stabilise now at the moment. There is still some issue about how flexible working will impact office markets, but we are starting to see the economic growth show up in improved activity in the leasing market. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, moving on to the retail sector, this chart uh, shows annual turnover growth for retail in Australia going back to 1985. Now from the global financial crisis in 2009 through to the pandemic, retail in Australia had been suffering relatively low turnover volumes and there were a number of reasons for that. You know, one is of course the rise of online sales. We've also had a period of relatively low wages growth and there were also changing demographics as people changed uh, their living habits and their shopping habits. That all um, added to relatively low uh, turnover growth for the past decade, apart from when we had a small housing boom just after the GFC. That changed with the uh, COVID pandemic. Initially, uh, retail sales spiked on uh, non-discretionary purchases. Everyone bought their toilet papers and canned goods as they went into shutdown. But because we couldn't travel and um, most people still had a job, that spending then moved to more non-discretionary items and we've seen some quite strong growth in uh, retail turnover over the past 12 months. Go to the next slide please. I mentioned uh, online sales um, that also grew incredibly during uh, the pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, the share of online sales of total retail was about 9.4%. Uh, that share increased by just about half a percent over 2019. So at the start of 2019, it was about 9%. By the start of 2020, it was 9.4%. During the pandemic, online sales increased by three and a half percent. So the total now is about 13.3 percent share, still relatively low, but a very big increase due to the pandemic. And that is uh, also contributing to um, sort of a weaker environment for retail investment. And that's shown in this next slide, please. Now, because of those structural headwinds I mentioned, retail has been uh, suffering. So there was a peak in transaction volume in 2017, which you can see in that slide, and transaction volume had been declining ever since. However, the latest data we received yesterday from Morgan Stanley International showed that while capital uh, values declined a little bit further in Q1, the rate of decline has slowed substantially. It looks like we could be nearing a bottom for the retail market. They could be finding a floor in their values moving forward. If we go to the next slide, please. Now the, the headwinds for the retail sector have been tailwinds for the industrial sector, similar to many other markets around the world. Um, Australia's share of manufacturing had been declining since the mid 70s, but what had been taking over was logistics as we imported more materials and had to move that quickly around. Um, also, of course, the rise in online sales, which I mentioned uh, earlier, that share rising to about 13.3% during the pandemic. There was another uh, factor as well. I mentioned changing demographics for retail. Changing demographics also were occurring in the uh, industrial sector. There's two pictures on the bottom of this slide and they relate to the South Sydney Industrial Precinct. If you've ever flown into Sydney, and travelled from the airport into the CBD. If you look to the left out of your, your taxi window, uh, if you were there 10, 15 years ago, you would have seen a lot of industrial property. You can see in this particular chart on the bottom left, lots of big warehouse roofs. But by 2019, most of those warehouses had been knocked over and residential property had been developed. And you can see all the, the apartments there on the right. Most of the uh, industrial sector properties had moved to ring roads around the major CVDs, which allowed large scale investment quality industrial property to be built, uh, which is taking advantage of improved computer technology and, and better transport to service the, uh, the rising e-commerce market. And that's been a big tailwind for the industrial sector. If we go to the next slide, please. 
that's shown up in the uh, transaction volumes. So in this chart, whereas uh, in retail we saw volumes peaking in 2017, they've just been getting stronger and stronger for the uh, industrial sector. A lot of that has been, uh, the green line is Australia-wide, that's where a portfolio has changed hands. And as I've just mentioned, uh, the milestone portfolio. D did you want to make any comments here, Josh? I think, John, you kind of covered there, but obviously the milestone portfolio, I think you'll see those figures in 2021 jump significantly. Um, uh, going back to the sector, the sectors you looked at before, industrial will become one of the most invested sectors in the next couple of years. Um, a lot of capital is chasing that. Um, just outside of the milestone deal, Blackstone did another transaction, 900 mil, um, which both uh, PGIM and, um, and Manulife picked up there as well. So you've nearly seen in the order of you know 4.7 billion uh, transacted in, in just in two transactions um, in the last quarter there as well. But you know there's a lot of global capital. Um, all has the same sentiment towards industrial. Um, and as you rightly pointed out on the global yield um, graph, you know, Australia still looks attractive uh, and it's been very attractive to a lot of that overseas capital. Thanks, Josh. I think we've got a final slide here now. Just sort of summing up, uh, Australia did experience its first recession in nearly 30 years last year, but has bounced strongly. The risk to further growth is uh, further outbreaks of COVID, but we are expecting above average growth for the next couple of years. Investment has bounced back strongly also, supported by uh, a relatively strong economy and low interest rates and relatively attractive yields. Uh, office did suffer in uh, 2020 as vacancy rates went up and rents went down, but that seems to be resetting now in 2021. Retail's been adapting to structural change for the last few years, but it looks like we could be nearing a floor in the market. And in the headwinds for uh, retail have proved to be tailwinds for industrial, and we've got very strong demand for industrial property. So that's all from me. So I'll hand it back to Catherine and the panel. Thank you, John. Uh, so now is our question time. So I'd like to open um, the floor to our audience to ask um, to ask us as many questions as you have. Um, and I already see a few questions coming and I'll pick the ones on Australia first. Um, I saw a question regarding yield compression in Australia and uh, the audience asked, so even the yields are now at record low at around only five to, to uh, four to five percent. Uh, it's still much higher than the other mature markets in Asia. What's your view on the future outlook of cap rates of various asset classes in Australia, especially when interest rates are at record low? Um, Josh, are you able to answer this this one, this question? Thank yeah, you. I, I think it's, it's obvious. I think um, as we've kind of uh, mentioned during the presentation, we look very attractive on a global scale for returns. Um, we hold a lot of calls with offshore capital. Uh, most of those uh, groups have Pan-Asian funds which dedicate money across all the regions in Asia, all the countries in Asia, but we do get a lot redirected towards Australia now because one, we are uh, showing better returns um, than other, other cities within the region there as well. Um, and I think, you know, our economy is in is in really good shape um, and that's leading again to more confidence probably in the leasing sectors across leasing markets across all the sectors and that's bringing confidence uh, we've seen that on a few of our recent campaigns we've been closing where you know i think it's probably 80 percent foreign capital bidding for our, our assets and we're heading towards more record record yields um, so i think you know summing all that up it really is is a total attraction for global capital um, based upon our recovery out of COVID. Thank you, Josh. So speaking of global capital, we have another question on foreign investment into um, into Australia. So would you share a bit more insight on the composition of foreign investors in, in Australia and have this changed over the past few years, um, especially during the pandemic? 
um, and maybe at the same time you can uh, it will be helpful to answer a follow up question on the competition from local local investors. Is it now stronger or weaker than that during the pre COVID time? Look, I think as John highlighted or in the presentation highlighted, our our attraction to foreign capital has been growing and compounding year on year for the last five years. Um, and certainly coming out of the pandemic or coming out of the COVID times, I think that's growing even stronger again uh, for all the reasons we mentioned answering the first question there as well. Um, the domestic capital has been active. It hasn't, hasn't been as active as previous years. Um, you know, our local super funds, our local REITs have probably been priced out of the market, um, to be honest, and chasing those low returns. Some of our wholesale funds have lowered their um, total returns, so they are becoming more competitive in there. But um, on a true scale of, you know, foreign capital versus domestic capital, I'd say we're probably going to be sitting around that 60 to 70 percent of foreign capital chasing our assets down here. Uh, and that will continue to grow as we continue to recover. Well, that's really impressive, 16 to 70 percent. Um, we have another question on office investment. Um, as on the slides, we you show there's an uh, increasing uh, increasing proportion of office investment in Australia, despite despite the negative absorption seen in the past 12 months. Would you? Uh, what do you think are the major demand drivers in the office market, and what's your view on rental and capital value outlook over the next three to five years? I will say that looking at that graph where we kind of had the portion of office there, I think that was made up of some large transactions um, to take place at the back end of 2020 and what we've seen carry over to 2021 um, that way there. I, I do expect, like I said before, industrial to probably uh, rise past and, and go past the kind of um, uh, transaction volumes of office um, in the foreseeable future. Um, look, I think what is attractive, obviously, as you mentioned, the returns there as well, but I think people can see, unfortunately, you can't travel, but people can obviously see that the Australian economy, um, which leads to workforce, larger companies are getting back into the office, um, seeing those numbers, seeing activity across the major CBDs is a big plus. Um, the majority of these overseas investment houses do have some form of team down here or some kind of managers down here as well on mm. their behalf so they are kind of getting that feedback from those managers or their own team members and seeing that kind of recovery there as well uh, as john said the leasing market has been slowed down um, uh, face rents holding up um, uh, incentives have gone out a little bit but um, i think groups are very comfortable in underwriting um, asset opportunities in the australian market now uh, and again, due to our kind of um, quicker and more positive re recovery out of COVID. Thank, thank you, Josh. Um, and we have one more question on on alternative investment in Australia. Uh, so for foreign investors, how easy is it to access Australia's alternative asset classes such as data center and multifamily or student housing? And what are the return perspectives? Uh, look, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of alternate investment sectors uh, emerging. I'd say they're still emerging in the Australian market um, compared to some of our other markets around the globe there as well. So obviously data centers has been around for a while. Um, uh, we don't have that, man, that many or that much opportunity in that sector down here as well, but that's certainly seen cap rate compression for anything that be out, out of the COVID times for any data centers there as well. Our multi-family or build to rent, so to speak, um, a lot of focus has been um, spent looking at this market in Australia. We probably aren't at the maturity levels um, uh, or, or the um, volume levels to make it a huge sector right now. Uh, and that is due to some of our um, you know, federal legislation and also individual state legislation in terms of tax returns and making it a uh, an MIT class of asset down here, um, but uh, nearly every group that does look at the office industrial retail sectors um, has ambitions to certainly have a build to rent kind of portfolio or multifamily portfolio down in the Australian market here as well. And one other one that we're starting to see more interest in is life science 
Um, so that's becoming a real sector or focus of um, international capital there as well. So um, a bit hard to benchmark some of those returns as the sectors are quite immature, um, but certainly quite a, a strong focus from overseas capital wanting to get into those sectors. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, Josh, for that. And I'll get into uh, uh, the, the question on some of the other APAC markets that we covered. Uh, so I see a question on Singapore as it, as it uh, recently saw a big jump in investment volume in Q1. And the question asks, in what stage of investment cycle do you see Singapore as currently in? And where are the opportunities this year? Uh, the, 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 Dennis, would you be able to help answer this question since you are based in Singapore? Yes, I will. Thank you, Catherine. Well, the main reason was that amongst the Southeast Asian countries, Singapore had the pandemic situation under control and economic activities were well underway in Q1, right? Of course, uh, notwithstanding now that we are in somewhat a lockdown situation for the next 30 days due to import of the Indian COVID variant B1617, about 10, 10 days ago, right? But really for the 725 square kilometers island state, you know, very limited real estate coupled with increased demand as we see record numbers of family offices and funds setting up in Singapore. This will naturally push demand and prices to record levels. So for a start, it was the luxury residential, the multifamily as we call it and more recently offices right the prices have been pushed up to to record high uh, very recently a floor of strata office in samsung hub of approximately 12,000 square feet was transacted at four thousand fifty dollars per square foot that's approximately um us three thousand dollars per square foot that's the strata floor Okay, um, of office in the CBD. Well, Singapore is also well placed for many Chinese tech companies as well as multinational companies locating their international or regional offices, right? With reasons um, including the geopolitical strain situation between China and the US, and of course, the Hong Kong situation. So really, in summary, there's really very limited uh, a location that international uh, multinational companies, you know, would place their international or regional uh, office right, was set up. So so Singapore is actually um, very well placed for that. So so as a result of that, you know, demand for office and everything else, including residential, retail, industrial properties have actually increased over the last few years. You know, not, not, notwithstanding that we are still in the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation. So we expect this to continue in an upward trend, you know, um, not of course at the, at the moment, you know, we, are, we have a blip in that uh, we have this COVID variant uh, B1617 that we are experiencing now in Singapore. Favoured asset types continue to be logistics and industrial, including biotech, biomed, though very scarce. Okay, this class of assets is very scarce uh, in Singapore as is governed by the JTC. Okay, um, offices, yes, including central and increasingly outlying and suburban offices okay, uh, are getting uh, popular. And of course, uh, multifamily residential. But of course, I must say that uh, multifamily residential, as we call it here, are more a trading asset class, right? Where developers would develop and then they would um, they they would sell. Okay, because really of the ABSD um, to own an asset of residential as as an on block, um, you you literally have to pay additional buyer stamp duty. Well, that's it for me on the Singapore part. Thank you very much, Dennis, for your answer on Singapore. It seems like us Singapore is becoming uh, increasingly popular and we should definitely do our uh, next webinar uh, on Singapore. 
Um, I see another question on India uh, regarding the, the, the recent surge of COVID, which had an impact on India's supply chain as many factories and stores are now closed. Uh, is there any impact on the commercial real estate market? And do you see uh, investors being turned away from India as a result of the recent COVID surge? And I will give this question to Gordon. Would you like to answer this one, Gordon? Thank you, Catherine. Um, I like Dennis's word um, <laughs> that it's a blip. Uh, and if you go back to sort of John's presentation, he put up a slide, I think it was slide 12, where he had India at the top of the list for GDP outlook for the next 10, 20 and 30 years. So I think you do need to think about it in the context of this being a relatively short term blip uh, in the overall uh, evolution of the Indian real estate sort of market. Obviously, truly devastating uh, what is happening at the moment, uh, but it is gradually getting control. I think we've got to go back about sort of 10 days to sort of the 6th or 7th of May uh, when we sort of saw the peak uh, sort of daily cases uh, running at about sort of 400,000 uh, a day. And that sort of subsequently sort of come down a little bit. Um, so thoughts uh, are with colleagues and, and friends in India. Um, I mean, it does also, of course, sort of demonstrate and stating the obvious, you know, for a country that's not reached uh, herd immunity through either a sort of a combination of, of cases uh, and or sort of vaccination at what the risks uh, continue to be of sort of COVID. Um, picking up on your question, uh, the question specifically around sort of the, the industrial and the sort of the logistics arena, you know, the regulation and infrastructure uh, is really sort of ultimately strengthening the prospects uh, for uh, those two sectors uh, in India. Um, you know, that's not going to go away uh, because of COVID. India, you know, needs to develop modern warehousing uh, to keep pace with um, both sort of e-commerce uh, and then secondly, kind of the requirement for rising food standards um, to feed its own sort of population. Um, you know, so that's going to continue uh, and accordingly capital will continue to flow uh, to India to develop uh, out sort of the real estate uh, and even so far this year we've seen some big ticket sort of transactions mm -hmm. uh, for example sort of Blackstone um, acquiring a uh, platform from uh, sort of Wahlberg. Of course I guess kind of what might pause uh, is sort of the growth and activity associated with um, sort of manufacturing and light manufacturing, I guess what you might describe as sort of China plus sort of strategies. Um, you know, while con COVID sort of continues, you know, it might simply not be practical to shift production and activity uh, and take advantage of those sort of wave, wage and labour sort of fundamentals that you've got uh, in sort of in the Indian market. I guess in the short term, you know, that might be uh, of benefit to at China, um, you know, retaining operations in China, uh, but also potentially of benefit to sort of parts of, of Southeast Asia as well, uh, like the sort of the Vietnam market. Oh, thank you uh, very much, Gordon. And um, it's um, surprising that you actually mentioned Vietnam because our next question is on Vietnam. And um, it seems that um, uh, economic fundamentals in Vietnam are quite strong, almost on par with China. What's the investment landscape in Vietnam like right now? Do you see uh, in increasing foreign cap capital participation in the country? Um, I'm not sure, uh, do you or did Dennis want to pick up this one on Vietnam? Uh, Dennis, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure, I'm um, happy to do this. Um, Yes, you know, Vietnam do have the economic fundamentals, including population, rising middle class, etc. right? And, but it is some 10 to 15 years behind China in the country's development. So this is where lies the, oppor the opportunities, right? So, and further, you know, the China plus one policy adopted by MNCs will continue to accelerate the investments in manufacturing, logistics, supply chain. OK, so for the last five to six years, there were numerous direct investments by manufacturers, industrial and logistic companies, but very few funds invested because investment grade assets were scarce. This is very much similar to India, you know, uh, five, six years ago, where there's really no quality assets, right? But still in Vietnam, we have the likes of ESR, 
who joined venture with Becamex, the latter being one of the largest uh, industrial land owners in Vietnam, that started to develop quality logistics and industrial facilities over the last few years. Of course, not forgetting Sam Corp, who has been in Vietnam uh, for over 20 years. They continue to develop their industrial parks across Vietnam. So it is most likely that over the next few years, you will see quality investment grade logistics and industrial assets made available in Vietnam. You know, other asset class that are favored would be prime office buildings, though must, I must say that it's very limited number of uh, singly owned buildings in the two major cities of Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, right? So, so really in summary for Vietnam, if you could do development, go now, or do a joint venture, whatever, go now and develop a world-class international facility building, facilities building or a, a park, right? A, a business park or so, you know, but if not, then you got to, my advice would be to keep investigating, keep researching the market, and of course, working with us for assets which meet your investment criteria as uh, as Vietnam continues to develop. Oh. All I'll add is, you, yeah, uh, don't leave it till late. <laughs> it's happening <laughs> now. Um, but I guess in a sort of Southeast Asian sort of contrast, um, ex sort of Singapore, um, you know, it is notable that international developers and operators like those logistics groups that just been mentioned by uh, sort of Dennis are prioritizing Vietnam over some of the other countries in sort of Southeast Asia. And that just sort of goes to, you know, the openness and receptiveness uh, towards sort of foreign capital uh, and the rules and regulations uh, kind of around that. And um, so um, uh, we've certainly got people that are able to uh, navigate, uh, help you navigate uh, through that sort of um, uh, the structures applicable for the Vietnam market. Thank, thank you, Gordon. Um, we have one last question on Hong Kong. Uh, do you see any significant pricing adjustment as a result of a recent rental drop in Hong Kong? When do you think the market will likely turn around? Gordon? You're going to direct that one to me, <laughs> yes. Give, given I'm here. Yeah, given you're busy on Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, so capital markets, um, I would sort of say, has turned around. Uh, we've seen a sort of a pickup in activity. Um, the reality is that the sort of the Occupy markets um, still remain um, a little bit misty. Um, if you want some numbers to it, I guess sort of on the office side, you know, has there been a price adjustment of five to 10%? There's obviously been some well cited examples of uh, sort of price adjustment, for example, on the city plaza trades uh, that we've seen. Um, but actually, more recently, there's been a tender um, of a site uh, at Caroline Hill Road and sort of Causeway Bay. Uh, and I believe that that actually traded above sort of estimations. Um, so, you know, that is certainly encouraging. Um, it was mentioned earlier that see kind of half the um, activity by volume. Uh, in Q1 was directed towards the industrial and logistics sector. Um, you know, that's really because of the opportunities around sort of revitalization uh, or alternative uses. So I would suggest we haven't seen a great deal of pricing adjustment in that uh, sort of arena. Uh, retail side, thin trading, aside from a few sort of high street shops. Of course, those high street shops may well have seen rents decline from their peak three, four years ago. Uh, might be off as much as sort of 30 to 40, possibly even as much as sort of 50 percent in some instances. Um, but actually, you've probably only seen sort of modest yield adjustment. Um, but you know, that ultimately kind of means it's probably been the most uh, sort of impacted market uh, during the last sort of 18 months to sort mm -hmm. of two years. Residential is obviously kind of holding up well. Um, but certainly sentiment has improved. Uh, plenty of investors, international investors as well, are back participating uh, sort of in the market. Um, but as I say, the cautionary note is around the sort of the occupier market still being a little bit misty. We've still got continued net negative absorption. We've got some new supplies sort of coming through. You've got this sort of ongoing decentralization story, which also mm. kind of creates potential sort of opportunities. Um, but you've also got the prospect of returning Chinese corporate activity. 
um, all of that sort of put together means it's quite tough to sort of call the bottom uh, and the sort of direction of travel on the occupier side uh, over the course of the next two to three years. Uh, but capital market side, pick up in activity, pick up in sentiment, deals beginning to happen, uh, all of that side quite encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, uh, uh, that's definitely a good sign that we are seeing here. So I think um, we've answered every question that I see um, on the Q&A list. So I will now hand it back to Jamie for the uh, final closing. Back to you, Jamie. Great stuff. Thanks, Catherine. So to summarize, um, we heard uh, from Catherine, obviously, about how Asia Pacific markets are experiencing a strong recovery. Passing on to John Sears, who highlighted that Australia was a core component of this with consumer sentiment now running at an 11 year high and an outlook which can be considered one of the best of all advanced economies globally. Uh, Josh uh, commented that from Q4 through Q1, we saw a rebound across most sectors with industrial being a major beneficiary and office picking up pace as Australian yields still look attractive to global capital, increasing competition versus the local players. Dennis pointed out uh, that Singapore had COVID under uh, reasonable control early in Q1 2020, uh, but despite being back into lockdown more recently, the limited amount of real estate in Singapore versus the increased demand will continue to force prices to record highs. Then we moved on to, to Gordon, who provided useful insight on India. Uh, suggesting that despite the challenging situation, this is a relative blip in, the, in uh, India's overall trajectory of the real estate market over the long term. India's infrastructure investment will continue and capital will flow into the ongoing build out of the real estate market there. On that note, our thoughts go out to our friends in India at this difficult time. Gordon also commented on capital markets have turned around in Hong Kong, but the outlook for occupier demand remains a little misty, though sentiment is approving quickly. So thank you to Catherine Chen and John Sears for their insightful presentation. Do reach out to them if you need further information. Big thanks also to our panelists, Josh Cullen, Dennis Yeo and Gordon Marsden. As always, please drop Catherine Chen or I an email if you wish to subscribe for our Asia Pacific Investor and Developer News Feed or any other Cushman and Wakefield publications. We will be back at the end of Q2 with the latest Cushman and Wakefield updates, kicking off with the, on 20th July with our regular Greater China update featuring a spotlight on Guangzhou. And then on Wednesday, 11th August, for our Asia Pacific update featuring a spotlight on Singapore and Southeast Asia. Both webinars to be held at 10 a.m. Hong Kong and Singapore time. Thank you very much for listening in. Keep in contact and we look forward to engaging with you again soon. Goodbye.